Let's get started. All right. Um, so, actually, turn off. We turn off that light. You got it. All right. So, uh, so last class we spent uh, time doing an introduction to concurrency control, uh, and we discussed a uh, so the, the the basic concepts are behind different transaction models, and then we spent some time talking about at a high level a bunch of the different concurrency control algorithms that are out there. Um, and we showed that an evaluation of these algorithms on a many core CPU simulator, that they all sort of start to fall apart. Um, and so we're sort of ignoring the extreme case of running at 1,000 cores. And for, the, for this lecture and on Wednesday, we're just going to say, well, you know, given what, what hardware we have today, what's the best we can do? And so for today's class, we're going to focus on, in the beginning, different isolation levels and the concept of isolation levels and show how maybe uh, there are isolation levels or anomalies that can occur that are not captured in the sort of standard isolation levels that you learn about uh, when you, or when you use a database system. And then from that, we'll show how in particular there's this one isolation level uh, that is more emblematic or is better representative of what multi-version concurrency control can do. And then we'll discuss modern variants of it and how they sort of overcome that particular anomaly that, that can occur and to achieve, and, and achieve serializability. Because that's, again, that's sort of the gold standard of what we want uh, when we want to run transactions. OK, so, and actually real quick, in terms of the project, uh, there are some issues with Autolab. We're working on fixing that. Everyone who's signed up to audit the course should now have access and be able to submit things. Um, and I don't think there's any other is really issues that have cropped up. Yes? When Autolab gives you a zero, doesn't mean you're wrong. Correct. Yeah, we're working on that. Uh, and I think there's somebody else had a problem where Joy posted some updates and Autolab didn't have the correct version because it can't, doesn't have network access, so it can't pull down the latest version. We're trying to fix all that, try to get, you know, do the best we can. They gave us a 100 gigabyte v or hung, uh, a VM with 100, 100 gigabytes of RAM so we can you know, max out these things and see what they can actually do. But we're still, it's our first time. OK. And so maybe I'll spend some time on Wednesday talking about uh, debugging methods and other things, uh, you know, things for you to t try things out. OK. So the stuff we talked about last week, when we talked about that many core evaluation, all of the transactions uh, that were tested in, in that paper were all running with the serializable isolation level. Um, and serializability is useful. It's a, a useful construct or abstraction because it allows you, as the application developer, to not worry about uh, different anomalies and different variances that can occur uh, in, in the database when you run transactions. Right? So you don't have to worry about getting back vector clocks and trying to figure out what the correct value is. You don't have to worry about whether you're reading dirty data and things like that. If you're running transactions with a true serializable isolation level, and I say true because some systems, I'm not going to name names, when you say, I want serializable, you're going to get snapshot isolation, which we'll show, show in a second. So if you, if you ignore, if you, if you can ignore all these concurrency issues, right, it's much easier to write programs. In the same way that if you're writing in Java or like Python, you don't really worry about memory management that much, right? Now, you don't have to worry about malloc and free like you do in C++, and it makes you much more productive, right? And of course, you, but you sacrifice performance, and that's sort of the same boat with ser uh, serializability. So it may be the case in our application, we want to use a weaker light level of isolation um, in order to improve, improve performance and improve scalability in the system, right? So these are what the isolation levels allow us to do. The, it's the isolation level allows the application to tell the database system, I want you to execute this transaction uh, and allow for some possible anomalies to occur. Now, we're not saying that they will occur. We're saying that the database system is not going to do extra work to make sure that they never possibly could. Right? So if you say your application only has one thread and it executes one transaction one at a time, that's going to be in serializable order no matter what isolation level you, you set because, again, it's running in serial order. So again, so they're going to allow us to, on a per transaction level, expose the transaction to different types of anomalies. And if you took an introduction to database course, everyone should be familiar with these uh, different things, right? So these are the different anomalies that can occur. So what's a dirty read anomaly in, in, in a transaction? What does that mean? Read right, you read, read data that was, that was written by another transaction that has not committed yet. What's unrepeatable read? Read 
Somebody other than Zeke. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So the it's I, I you, you execute a query, you read some value, some object, some other transaction comes along and then updates that value. You read it again and you get back a different result. All right. That's an unrepeatable read. This one's a bit more complicated. What's, what's an example of a phantom read? Yes. Right, so, so that's half of it, right? So the, what he said was, I do a scan. Say I'm doing, I have a table, a bunch of students, and I want to scan all the students that are aged 18 to 30. I scan it the first time, then somebody uh, inserts somebody who's age 25. I scan it again, and I, I get a different value, or I, I, I see something that wasn't there before. You can do the reverse of this, right? Say someone deletes someone who's age 25. I scan it again, and the tuple that I saw before is now, has now disappeared, right? And this is why it's called a phantom, sort of a ghost. It sort of comes in and out, right? So based on these three anomalies, uh, this is how they're going to define uh, in, in the ANSI standard for SQL what the different isolation levels could be, right? And if you're not familiar, ANSI is sort of the American, the United States equivalent of ISO, right? It's sort of a, a standards body in the, in the U.S., uh, that can specify uh, these kind of things, right? ASCII is sort of is something that came from, from these guys as well. So going from, from top to bottom, uh, these are the different sort of protections that you can get. So serializable is obviously the most, uh, you get the most protection because you're saying there's no phantoms, no dirty reads, and, and all reads will be repeatable. Then as you go to repeatable reads, you, you, you may allow phantoms to happen. And again, we say they may happen because Again, it depends on what the workload is, depend, what, depends on what else was running in the system at the same time. Read committed, you may get uh, phantoms and unrepeatable reads, and then read uncommitted is basically you have no protection, you're reading whatever you want, and who cares, right? Uh, another way to think about this is sort of in this, in this kind of hierarchy where you're sort of going from, from bottom to top, you get more protections as you go up. And we'll show this graph again later on when we bring in the different uh, isolation levels that, that exist. All right, so the, the, these four basic stand, or isolation levels were defined in the SQL 92 standard that obviously came out in 1992. And then a few years after that, there was a paper, actually, sorry, before we get to that. Um, sorry, I missed this. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what the actual systems are doing, so this is actually a table that was generated by Peter Bayless a few years ago. And this is just showing for a bunch of different widely used systems, here's the default isolation level, and here's the maximum level that they can support. And so what you'll see is that, except for Ingress and VoltDB, everyone else is running at something below serializable. Read commit is probably the most common one. Um, MySQL runs at repeatable reads, and I think Facebook runs at, at this level too, and, and they're okay with that. Um, two things to point out is, first you see VoltDB uh, is running at, at, at the default serializable, and the maximum obviously can be serializable. VoltDB uses that same h protocol that you guys learned about in last class, right? It's that you partition the database and you have these serial, uh, single-threaded execution engines that are executing transactions one after another. So just by the nature of that concurrent control scheme, everything's going to be serializable, right? So it's not doing any, anything extra. The other thing to point out is over here, in the case of Oracle, its maximum isolation level is this thing called snapshot isolation. Right? That's kind of weird, right? That's not a isolation level that we just defined in, in our, our list of four from before. And so before, actually, I think if you ask for serializable, you actually don't get serializable. You get snapshot isolation. We'll talk about that, what that looks like in a second. So as I was starting to say before, uh, the standard came out in 1992, and they defined the, these four isolation levels. And then a few years later, uh, some, fun, some famous database people came out with this paper that basically said, and critiqued these isolation levels and said, it doesn't actually capture everything that can occur uh, when you have concurrent transactions. So therefore, they're not, they're kind of faulty. So in particular, the main complaint was the standard assumes that the database is running some kind of two-phase locking scheme. But when you use timestamp ordering, like MVCC, there's other anomalies that can occur that these isolation levels don't capture, right? So again, this is the standard came out in 1992. At the time, most database systems were using two-phase locking. With the exception of Oracle and Postgres, uh, DB2 certainly was two-phase locking, Ingress, uh, Sybase, Informix, all these guys were not using 
MVCC or, uh, and, uh, and, or timestamp ordering. So that's why sort of they focused on that when they defined the standard. So in this critique, they come up with two different isolation levels that go beyond what the, the, four, the four levels can, can capture. So in particular, they talk about cursor stability and snapshot isolation. So I'm going to go through each of these uh, real quickly. But the snapshot isolation, the main thing to remember is this is what you get by default when you use multi-version concurrency control, when you use sort of the, the textbook algorithm of multi-version concurrency control as we teach in like 615, you get snapshot isolation. You don't get the other four levels. So let's talk about cursor stability. The basic idea of cursor, cursor stability is that the, you can think of a cursor as the internal state of the database system as it processes a query. Right? So let's say you're doing a full table scan uh, and you're reading block by block in the table. The cursor is basically pointing at one block at a time, right? Uh, if you're scanning an index, you know, it could be the node on the index, on the leaves. So the idea is that the database system will maintain a lock on, on the cursor, on the item that the cursor is looking at, until it completes all its operations and wants to do with that item, and then releases it and goes on to the next item. The cursor moves to the next thing. So again, if you're scanning a table going from block to block, before you, you can scan, act, you know, access the data in that block, you acquire a lock on it, you do whatever it is you need to do, then you give it up and move on to the next guy. Right? And we don't have to worry about deadlocks because we're only acquiring one lock at a time. So sort of one thread that's processing a query can only have one, has one cursor, and that cursor can only have one lock. So cursor stability is to provide us a stronger isolation level guarantee uh, than read committed. Um, but it's slightly weaker than repeatable reads. And in particular, it's going to allow us to prevent sometimes something what's called the lost update anomaly, which is not possible uh, under read committed. So to give an example of this, what this looks like, so say we have a transaction T1 and another transaction T2, and these guys start exactly the same time. So transaction T1 wants to do a read on A, and then it stalls to do some processing, and then it does a write on A. Transaction T2 will start, do something else, uh, then do a write on A, do further processing, and then finally commit. So let's say then we're running at, at, at a lower isolation level. Right? We're not running on stri strict two-phase locking. We're not running at serializable. We're running at something lower. So, and also assume for this example that we only have one core in our system. So we're only going to have one sort of program counter uh, that's going to say, this is the operation I'm executing at this time. So transaction T1 starts. It does the read on A. Then context switch over to transaction T2. He does the write on A. And then we come back here, he does the write on A, and then we commit. And now this guy comes and commit, commits. So what happens here? What's the problem here? Right, the update on transaction 2 is lost, right? Even though it committed after T1, right? So if we use a cursor lock, then the cursor would be accessing the block or whatever, whatever the item is that holds A here. And then it would hold that lock until it commits, right? assuming that it doesn't move on to the next guy. Right? And so in this case here, when this guy tries to do the write on A, the, its cursor was not, would not be able to get that lock on the thing that's holding A, and therefore would have to stall. And then when it finishes, then it can do its write, and then it can, can commit. Right? Again, we're talking at something, something lower than serializability here. Right? So this, under strict two-phase locking, uh, A would be holding, you know, transaction one would hold the lock on A until it actually finishes. Right, but now we're trying to run at a lower isolation level. We want to relax some of these things to increase the amount of uh, concurrency. Now, you can also argue, too, let's say that uh, the reason why we say a cursor lock sometimes prevents the lost update anomaly, because if this guy then did a read on B, and B is in some other block or some other item, then it has to acquire the cursor lock on that, and therefore that would allow this guy to do the right, and then we still have the lost update problem. So it doesn't solve all your problems. Uh, but it helps you in some cases and allows you to have better protection than you would without, without them. So is this sort of clear? So I think cursor stability is, again, this is not an isolation level you would be able to define in your system. Uh, something like DB2 does this by default. A lot of, a lot of different systems do, like, do this by default. But now let's talk about snapshot isolation. So the, the, the basic way to think about snapshot isolation is that it guarantees that when a transaction starts, it will see a consistent snapshot of the database that it existed at the moment that it started. So the key word in what I just said is consistent. 
And what that means is that if there's other transactions that started before our transaction, our new transaction started, uh, but, and they modify the database, but they haven't committed yet when our new guy starts, then our new transaction will not see any of their modifications because that's not a consistent view. Right? That's a torn, we have torn rights. We, we've only seen half of the transaction. So that's the basic idea. So, so you, you sort of pick a timestamp and you want to be able to view the database as it existed before that timestamp without seeing any dirty updates from transactions. So under snapshot isolation, a transaction will only commit as long as it, there are no conflicts with other transactions that have made updates since the last snapshot. Okay? Because right, that would be a right-right conflict. Now, this seems kind of awesome, right? This seems like pretty straightforward. This seems like, uh, and when we talk about multi-version concurrency control, you'll see how we don't actually have to do anything really special to provide snapshot isolation. Sure, it just happens in the by the nature of the concurrent control scheme. But snapshot isolation is not fully serializable. And in particular, it can suffer from the right skew anomaly. So rather than showing you guys like a proof that it's not serializable, or rather showing you transaction histories and try to figure out to show you exactly where this anomaly can occur, I like to use this as an example that was invented by Jim Gray, who's like sort of a, one of the Turing Warden databases. Um, to show you what this, the right skew anomaly looks like. For this, we'll use a database that has marbles. So we'll say that there's four marbles, two of them are black, and two of them are, are white. And the two transactions we want to execute exactly at the same time are do the following. The first guy wants to take any marble that's white and flip them to black. And the second guy wants to take any uh, marble that's white, sorry, any marble that's black and flip them to white. So when both of these guys start at exactly the same time, uh, they will have this consistent snapshot of the database, right? There's no other transaction running, so we don't see any, 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 any mixed things. So now what's going to happen is they're both going to modify, read the database, find all the, the marbles that have the color that they need to flip, and then they're going to flip them, right? So this guy wants all the marbles to be black, and this guy wants all the marbles to be white. But now what happens is when the transactions go to commit, and we have to write back these changes to the database, we're going to end up with something that looks like this. And why did this happen? Why do, we, why do we have two whites and two blacks? Right? Under snapshot isolation, this is allowed to happen because I read everything as it, as it existed when my transaction started. And these two guys don't have overlapping uh, uh, write sets, right? So there's no conflict there. So they're both allowed to apply their changes to, to the database one by one. Now, the reason, again, why snapshot isolation is not serializable, because what would happen if you had a serializable schedule is, first, the transaction one would change everything to black, then the second guy would change everything to white. So you would end up with the state of the database looking like that. Right? So that's why snapshot isolation is not serializable. So this has kind of been known for a while. Uh, and there has not actually been really any work done to try to rectify this actually until very rec recently, within the last eight, nine years. Uh, so Postgres was susceptible to this. Oracle was susceptible to this. And then around, I think, 2009, there was work done by Michael Cahill, uh, who was a PhD student down in Australia. And then now he's one of the co-founders of uh, Wire Tiger. And they basically came up with a technique called uh, serializable snapshot isolation, where you're going to track all of the, you know, the read-write set dependencies between these guys in a very efficient manner so that you can avoid this, this, you know, this update problem here. Um, I'm not really going to discuss it in too detail. It is actually now implemented in Postgres, uh, I think as of no, version 9.2. Um, there's a bug in it, so I don't think it's actually fully serializable that Peter Bayless found. Uh, but again, just to show you, again, this is traditionally MVCC would only provide snapshot isolation. So now all of these algorithms that we're going to talk about are going to be doing ser serializable updates or serializable uh, scheduling. So if we go back to our hierarchy that we had in the beginning. Now we can see we're going to add in cursor stability and snapshot isolation. So the first thing to see is that cursor, cursor stability is in between repeatable reads and read committed, right? Because it can handle the loss updates uh, that this guy cannot. And then snapshot isolation is kind of this weird thing on the side where it has certain guarantees that read, repeatable reads cannot provide but it's still susceptible to that write skew anomaly, which is not problematic in repeatable reads. 
right? So it's sort of this, this thing that's orthogonal to the, that isolation level. So is that sort of clear what snapshot isolation is providing, right? It's, it, we have to handle this right skew anomaly in, or, in order to be fully serializable. So now let's talk about multi-convergent -co concurrency control. And this is sort of the main thing that you guys focused on in the reading. So multi-version concurrency control is a timestamp ordering scheme that's going to use multiple versions of objects in the database uh, in order to maintain or to, in order to come up with uh, correct schedules or interleaving of operations. And the basic idea is that anytime a transaction does a write to an object, the database system is going to create a new version of that object. Right? It's not going to do that in place updates as you would in like two phase locking. You'll go create a new version some other, in some other location, and we'll talk about the different ways to do that. Uh, and then and when any transaction tries to read an object, it will look to find uh, the newest version that existed um, and has been safely committed to the database at the moment of when it started. Right? This is sort of the snapshot isolation guarantee. Now, multi version concurrency control, although it's used, I would say, in most of the new database systems that support transactions that have come out in the last, again, five, seven, eight years, they're all using MVCC. The basic idea has been around since 1978. Because in many cases of databases, a lot of the ideas are really old. Um, and so there was this dissertation by this guy named Reed uh, at MIT, and he sort of lays out the foundation of what, how to do multi-version concurrency control. But it wasn't until, I think, 1981, 1982, uh, where it was actually in implemented in a system. And I think this was, uh, it was Interbase was, was the, from DEC, was the, sort of the first database system that did MVCC. And the guy who implemented it in Interbase is Jim Starkey. He claims he invented MVCC, as far as I can tell from the readings. He also claims he invented blobs. I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, but there's definitely an earlier time when, when it existed. And Jim Starkey is actually one of the, um, the, the co-founders of, of NeoDB, which is one of these new, new SQL systems that have come out in the last, last few years. Uh, He's a pretty sharp guy. Okay, so let's look at a high-level overview of how MVCC works. And for this, I'm not going to use the fancy one in Hecaton. I'm going to use, again, sort of the textbook definition of how it basically works. And then from that, we'll build up and show how to do more complicated schemes. So we have a transaction here. It wants to do a read on A, a write on B, stall and do some processing, and then come back and do another write on A. So now in our database, uh, along with each record and any values that correspond to it, we're also going to track the write timestamps. So this is going to be the timestamp of the transaction that successfully committed and wrote to this, uh, wrote, sorry, the transaction that wrote this particular version. And so for here, we have these subscripts for the record to correspond to what version ID they are. And we'll see again when we talk about Hecaton how they're using the timestamps uh, that are allocated to transactions when they start as to indicate what version ID it is. So in the very beginning, our transaction starts. And we'll give it a transaction ID of a 10,001. It does the read on A. And this allows it to go and find the direct version that it, that it needs. And it can read that. Then it does a write on B. And then instead of overwriting B, um, we'll create a new version, and copy it and create a new version, and then have it be set with the right timestamp that corresponds to our transaction's timestamp. Then it stalls for a bit, does some waiting. Uh, and during this time, some other transaction that started after we did they come along and they do a write on A, which, which creates a new version and has a write timestamp that's in the future from when we started. So now what happens is when we come to this uh, point here and we try to do another write on A, what we'll see is that when we try to create a new version of A, somebody else has already come along and created a new version uh, before we did, uh, but they're in the future, so we don't want to overwrite this. Um, so we would have to uh, abort our transaction restart because otherwise we'd have a lost update problem. Right? So this is the basic you know, you know, algorithm, how it works. And you obviously can see there's a lot of ways to improve this and improve, reduce the number of erroneous aborts you would have to do. Uh, but we'll get to that when we talk about Hecaton. Okay, so again, I can't stress this enough. The, the, the basic algorithms are providing snapshot isolation for MVCC. And all of these algorithms that you guys read are doing extra stuff to provide serializable isolation. Yes. Yes. So suppose you were reading A, and if it was not committed, do you read that? Or? So his question is, um, let's say I so you're saying if instead of doing a write on A, actually say this guy does a write here. And I try to read A again. Would I, am I allowed to read this version? No, because it's in the future from you. 
right? Because I got a timestamp of when I started, right? If it's in the past, but it's not committed. So if it's in the past, so if it's like, say, say the guy, the transaction running at 10,000, timestamp 10,000, he's still running at the time we started. Uh, if, you, if you don't allow for speculative reads, you would not be able to see it. Because if you want to have a consistent snapshot, the guy at 10,000 has not committed yet, so it's not visible to you, right? Um, and then the, how you validate it at the end uh, to see whether you, you, know, you should have been able to read that and you didn't, you know, that, that depends on what the implementation actually does. I'm being very hand wavy here on like how this, this came up with this abort, other than to say it's a right-right conflict. But there's obviously different corner cases, and you saw this in the Hecaton paper. Depending on what the transaction state is, depending on what, you know, if you're reading something they wrote or you're trying to overwrite them, then the database system can make different choices about whether to abort you or not or let you proceed. Okay? Okay, so we're going to spend most of our time talking about Hecaton. Um, because I would say, again, this, this, I think this paper came out in, uh, well, they started working on Hecaton in, in 2008, but this paper is around 2009 or 2010. And this was sort of the, one of the first in a series of papers that have come, been coming out recently that's doing in-memory database MVCC and guaranteeing serializable, uh, serializable transactions. And then we'll spend some more time talking about the, the German system, Hyper, because they basically look at the, the Hecaton stuff and they make a lot of different choices to support different types of workloads. Um, we'll see how they, how they differ. And then quickly at the end, we'll talk about High Rise and HANA, uh, which is also mo more German stuff. Um, but the information for HANA is kind of limited, so we won't say too much. And then High Rise doesn't actually do anything, I would say, quite novel or significantly different than what Hecaton and um, Hyper do. But we'll see all these systems later on throughout the course because we'll read a lot of papers from, from all of them. Okay, so the Hecaton project was started as this internal a skunk work secret project at Microsoft to come up with a new engine for SQL Server that is optimized for online transaction processing workloads. So SQL Server, kind of prior to Hecaton, was sort of this general purpose system that did transactions sort of OK and did analytical queries sort of OK. And now where Microsoft is going is that now they have these specialized engines that are integrated in the system where Hecaton is one of them that allows you to, to, to handle these workloads in a more optimized fashion. So Hecaton is the sort of main memory engine to do fast transactions. And then Apollo is the sort of the, the, the data warehouse or the analytical processing engine to do fast um, you know, machine learning and, and, and OLAP operations. So they started this project internally in 2008. Um, and it was led by two pretty famous, well-known database people. So Paul Larson is a senior researcher at, database, at Microsoft Research Database Group. And I think like he's actually retiring this year. He just announced it. But he's sort of this old school guy that's been involved in a lot of different major advancements in databases in, in the last 20 or 30 years. Like he invented linear hashing in the 80s. Um, he's been involved in a lot of different things. Mike Zwilling is not a researcher, but sort of like this hardcore uh, famous database hacker. So when he was, at Mike, he was at Wisconsin in the early 90s, he helped build the Shore Storage Manager, um, which is sort of a very influential project. And then Microsoft hired him in like 1995, 96 to work on the team that was going to port Sybase to uh, Windows, and that, and that became SQL Server. So if you don't know the background of SQL Server is they were originally licensing the software from Sybase and having a port for it to be able to work on Windows NT. And then at some point they had this license, they, they bought the license out, and going forward, Sybase and SQL Server were sort of separate code bases. And so Mike Zwilling was sort of the, one of the main guys working on porting in Sybase code and making it work in the early days of Windows. So they had some design goals that they had to handle or requirements that they had to handle in order to make Hecaton work. The first is that they had to integrate with the entire SQL Server ecosystem. Right? And what that means is that they couldn't build this separate database system and sort of have it be this standalone thing and try to sell that. Right? Because everybody's using SQL Server, and they like all the tools and ecosystem that, that's around the SQL Server database system. So you want to be able to integrate with all of that without having to you know, support this whole separate thing. And the second thing is that they wanted to be able to support all possible OLTP application workloads that have came along uh, and have predictable performance. And what I mean by predictable is you don't want the performance, you don't want your one application have this amazing performance improvement, and then we're using Hecaton, and this other one actually get really worse. 
So this is why they couldn't use the single-threaded partitioning approach that you saw in the HDOR protocol, because that works really, really well for some applications that fit directly or map directly into the type of workloads that the system wanted to use. But then for other applications, things are worse. So you saw that when you increase the number of partitions per transaction, performance actually degrades. So you didn't want it to be the case if you, if you if someone bought Hecaton, right, you didn't want for some applications to get 50x improvement, and then for some other applications get negative improvement, right? Sort of like you don't want to sell a product, you say 90% of the you are going to be fine, 10% of the you are going to get cancer, right? You don't want that in your database system because then who, who, who would ever buy this? So by, by going with something like MVCC, it allows them to achieve this predictable performance, right? Because it's sort of this general purpose algorithm that can work reasonably well for a large number of applications. Um, and maybe you're not going to get the 50x improvement that you can get in HDOR, but you're getting 5x over what a, you know, SQL Server is doing today. That's, that's pretty good, right? So now let's talk about the, the, their version of MVCC. So the, the basic approach is that when a transaction starts, it's going to be assigned uh, a timestamp of when they begin, and then another timestamp that corresponds to their transaction ID. And we'll, we'll talk about how that works in a second. And then when they finish, they'll be assigned a, a, a timestamp that corresponds to when they ended, when they completed. And what's going to happen is internally the database system is going to maintain a, a, a chain of versions for the different tuples uh, that are being modified and updated over time. Right? So to sort of think that there's one single logical tuple that you as the application programmer see but internally, physically, it's going to store multiple versions and chain them together to allow you to traverse that chain to find the, act, the actual version, the correct version you're looking for. So every tuple is going to have three additional metadata fields that are sort of hidden from the application, but the database system is going to use this to figure out what's going on. So we'll have the begin timestamp, and this will correspond to the, the begin timestamp of the active transaction that created it, uh, or the end timestamp of, uh, of the transaction that committed that also created it. Then we have the end timestamp, and this is sort of confusing, but you have the begin timestamp of the active transaction that created it, the next version in the chain, or infinity if the transaction has not committed yet, uh, or the end timestamp of the committed transaction that created it. And then we have a pointer to the next version in the chain, and this is just, again, a memory address that allows us to say where memory is the thing we're looking for. So let's look at an example here. So let's say we have our database. Uh, and we have our header for each tuple, like begin, end, pointer, and then we, this one, for this particular example, we have two attributes. Um, and then we have our first tuple here, and then it has a pointer down to, to the second version here. And then above this, we have, we have an index. Now, in the paper, they talked about how the database, the heap of the database, is maintained as a hash table. I'm ignoring that for now, because it's not really important for understanding how the protocol works. Um, and they also talked about how you can have indexes pointing to the different versions down below. And again, that, that necessarily doesn't, doesn't, really mean, doesn't, doesn't really matter. All right, so let's start with the transaction. He's going to do a begin, and then we're going to allocate it at a timestamp at 25. So now when he wants to do a read on, read on this John record, we'll go into the index, for, and that's, say it's on, mapped on attribute 1, and we'll jump to the first tuple in our chain, and we'll look at the range that's specified by the begin and end timestamps here, so from 10 to 20. And we want to see whether our starting timestamp for this transaction falls in that range, and therefore this tuple is valid, and we, we can be able to look at it. In this case here, 25 doesn't fall in it, so we'd follow the chain and go to the next guy. Here we have 20 to infinity, and infinity means basically it's the, it's the newest version or the, uh, that could ever possibly exist at this point in time. And therefore, our begin timestamp falls, falls in this range, and that's the tuple we want to read. So now let's say we want to do an update on John. Again, same thing, we'll follow the index, we'll get to the first guy, see that he's, he's not the last version, so we'll jump to the next guy, uh, and see that this is the last version, because we see its pointer is empty, and we're going to be able to make a new version that, com that, com that comes next. So the first thing we'll do is we'll overwrite the infinity with our transaction ID. Right? And again, the transaction ID is essentially just going to be another timestamp, but they're adding a little one-bit flag to say that this is for a transaction and not a commit timestamp, right? And that is also providing a as, a, as a latch, to allow us to essentially lock the tuple and be the only transaction that updates this pointer, 
Right, so essentially, you find the tuple that corresponds to the last, the last version. You do a compare and swap on this field here to write in your transaction ID. If you acquire it, then you know that nobody else is going to come along and try to update this pointer to point something else while you're doing this. Right? So now, once I, once I have the latch, I'll create the new tuple, which is essentially a copy of this one. But then I update the attribute I want to modify. And then now I put in my transaction ID as the begin timestamp, and again, infinity as the as the end timestamp. Once this is safely done, now I'm allowed to go then update the pointer. So now, when my transaction commits, I'll have a I'm tracking the, the the read and write set for this transaction, so I know what tuples it has been modifying and messing around with. So then I can go back and go switch the transaction ID that I stored here to now put in the timestamp that I was allocated when I committed. So I'm sort of skipping a step. There's a validation part that we'll talk about in a second. But basically, when you commit, before you can tell the application, I'm done doing your transaction, you have to go and install these, these timestamps here so that now these things can become visible to any transaction that comes on later on. Is that sort of clear what's going on? Yes? Uh, before it had committed, there was a version that it was maintaining. If another transaction wants to update it, uh, okay, can, can, oh, next slide. One second. And uh, that will also, I guess, come. What about why do we need to maintain these previous versions if we have a new version? This question is why do you need, need to maintain previous versions if you have these other versions? Well, this, I mean, this is the basis of MVCC, right? The reason why I have these other versions because there could be a transaction that is still running that started before we did, and say it's just doing reads, it can still read these old versions. Right? Because we want, again, snapshot isolation means we want to guarantee we have a consistent view of the database. So it can always go back and read these older versions. And we're, since, we don't have to, since we're not having any locks, what's the great thing about MVCC is I can have my older query that's still running read these older versions and not mess around with anybody that's still that's making new versions and moving the chain forward. So the readers don't block the writers. So when do we find these garbage So his next question is when you garbage collect these old versions, We'll discuss that in a second. Yes, that's a, that's a very good point. Any other questions? OK, so now one of his first questions was, uh, what happens if someone tries to update the same thing? So for this, uh, I'm going to rewind time. This will be the same example. Uh, I was trying to figure out a way to show you guys that I was going to change, roll back to an earlier version of, of this diagram without being a big jump and figure out you know, everybody get lost. So we're going to roll back. Rewind to where we were before we actually did a commit. Okay, so now I notice here we're going back to having the, the the transaction IDs in the end and the begin here because this transaction is not committed yet. So now we have some other transaction. He starts at 30, and he wants to do a read on John. So in this case here, we'll follow the index just like before. Uh, we'll come along to this and see that we don't have a match. Uh, we don't fit in here, but then we can fit in here because our transaction comes after 25. And it's from infinity. So we're allowed to read this version here, uh, even though this transaction has not committed yet. We'll talk about in a second how you maintain some additional information to make sure that if this transaction ends up aborting, and therefore I was not allowed to see this version, uh, I don't actually try to commit uh, and you know, reading dirty data. Right? So I'm allowed to read this here, because I'm following that range. That's OK. But now if I try to do an update on this, what's going to happen is I'm going to see uh, I'll be able to jump directly to here, but I'll see that this version is, has not been committed yet. And in the case of Hecaton, to avoid write-write uh, conflicts, it's going to abort a transaction that tries to update something that's still, uh, update an object that's been modified by another transaction that's still in flight. So when they talk about the first writer wins, this is what they mean by it. If I try to update something that somebody else has already updated and that other guy has not committed yet, I can't proceed and I have to abort and roll back. Yes? So the question is, the reason why you uh, abort instead of waiting is because you don't want to wait. Correct. Yes, you don't want stalls. Right? Yes, it's more work to go, say if I restart this thing, it's more work to do all this stuff again. But it's, in practice, it's better than just waiting indefinitely. So in a, his question is, in a lock-based system, would you wait? Uh, if it's deadlock detection, yes. If it's... Uh, if it's, uh, I guess, wait and die or wound to wait, which one of those you, you would wait um, for some period before you time out. In no way, you just shoot yourself in the head right away and restart. 
Okay. All right, so you, you abort this transaction and restart it. OK, so one of the things that is going on in the system, beyond just maintaining, you know, here's, here's the different version chain, or here's the different version of the objects in the chain, there's going to be a global map in the system that's going to keep the track of the state of all the different transactions that are running. So when I go to read something, or when I go to commit, I go check to see what transaction had modified or, or, or created the object that I'm reading and go check this transaction state map to see whether it's going to be, it's aborting or whether it's still running. And then I can make different decisions about whether the transaction is allowed to proceed or not based on its state. So essentially the four states that could have is active, it basically means the transaction is still running, uh, and it still could do more reads and writes, you just don't know yet. Under the validating state, the trans application has told the database system, I want to commit this transaction. Uh, and is doing all the processing now to determine whether that transaction should be allowed to commit, and we can send an acknowledgment back to the application. Um, and this is when we're going to do all our checks to see what things that I read and who wrote to them, and am, am I allowed to finish. Once we get past the validation step, now we're committed, but we haven't gone back to the version chain for the things we modified and replaced our transaction ID with our end timestamp. We may have done some of them, but not all of them. But anybody who wants to know uh, could see that we have, we have committed and we, we eventually will do this. And then finally, in the terminated state, this is essentially just saying that the transaction has updated everything that it's ever going to update. There's nobody else to, waiting for it to commit. Uh, it's done. And at some point, there'll be a garbage collection process to go remove its state from, the, uh, from this map and all its possibly older versions. The basic idea here is like if, it's, if a transaction is either marked as terminated or it's not, not in there at all, then we know it's completely done. So now we want to go through what the transaction lifecycle is at, at a higher level, right? So we're going to talk about what events can occur in the transaction and then what the different phases are, we're going to be in. So at the very beginning, when we, when we call begin, our transaction is going to get that start timestamp and a transaction ID as well. And we'll set its state in the map to active. Then when it does normal processing, and again, doing, this is doing the reads and writes, executing SQL queries, accessing the database, uh, we're going to maintain some internal state to keep track of it, the read set, the write set, and the scan set. We'll talk about what that is in a second, but this is going to allow us to do validation to see whether we read or wrote something that we shouldn't have. Then we get the commit call from the application, so we enter this pre-commit phase. So now we'll assign the transaction an end timestamp, and we'll set the phase to be validating. And then on the validation, that's when we're going to go check all the reads and scans again to see, make sure that we're not, again, we didn't see something that shouldn't have been there. And again, this is different than two-phase locking. In two-phase locking, you don't need to do validation because the locks guaranteed the correct order. In our case, we let th things sort of run uninhibited, so now we need to make sure things are okay. And the validation stuff we'll, we'll talk about in a second, but this is essentially executing the reads and write, sorry, the, the reads and scans all over again. Right? You sort of, for every query you execute, you basically have to execute it twice. We'll talk about how to make that a little bit faster in a second, but that's, that's the general idea of what's going on here, because you want to see whether you get back a different result the second time. Then we do a commit. If we pass the validation, we set the transaction state to committed. We allow to do any post-processing. That's where we fix up the timestamps, and then eventually we, we terminate and the transaction's done. All right, so these are the basic steps that are occurring in, in, in this version of MVCC. All right, so the metadata we're going to keep track of are the, uh, the read set, the write set, the scan set, and the, and the commit dependencies. And for this, I, I mean, I'll talk about the optimistic versus pessimistic stuff in, the, in, in a second. I don't, like way, I don't like the way the paper was sort of described in like section three. Here's, here's the basic algorithm, but then here's the optimistic version and the pessimistic version. The optimistic version is essentially the same thing, the, the basic of the algorithm, so it's using all this stuff. So in the read set, what we're going to do is going to keep track of every pointer of every version that we've ever read. In the write set, we have to keep track of the pointers of any uh, versions we updated, either the old or new ones, any things we deleted or any things that we inserted. In the scan set, this is sort of tricky to understand, but we're going to store information about any scan operations that the, the, the database, sorry, the, the query did on the database so that we can go back and re-execute that scan again to check for phantoms. So you can think of this like, say you have a select query and it has a where clause. We don't care about what's in the, 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 you know, the projection fields of the, of the select query. We just care about the where clause, because that's going to allow us to be able to perform the op that, that query again. So that's sort of what we're storing here. 
And then the commit dependencies is for every single transaction, we have a list of all the transactions that are waiting for us to finish. And it's sort of like a pub sub notification kind of thing. So when we commit, we check our commit dependency list and we, we notify them that we, we're done. So now the validation step, given this metadata we're keeping track of, the two things we want to be able to do are to check for read stability, uh, which is going to allow us to check to see whether any version of an object that we read is still visible at the end of the transaction. So that means that nobody else, it, it didn't end up getting deleted uh, later on. And then we want to check for phantoms. And this is basically going to take that scan information that we, we, we were keeping track of and we basically rerun it again to see whether there are any new versions that have become visible since our transaction began. Right? So we scanned some range and nobody inserted anything in, in there. Right? Again, so think of like you have a select query and say it has some kind of complex user-defined function in the projection, like compute the one billionth digit of pi, and then it has some where clause and you know, where age between 18 to 30. You don't recompute the, 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 the user-defined function, you only re-execute the scan portion. So it's not as bad as executing the same query all over again, uh, but you do have to do some extra work. In transaction processing workloads, the read set of and the scan set of, 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 of queries is usually quite small, like you're grabbing single tuples at a time. Um, so this isn't necessarily a too bad, it's not that bad, it's not that bad to do this. Uh, we'll see when we talk about hyper how they, for analytical queries, this is problematic and you don't want to do this kind of tracking that they're doing. So now the, which of these two, these two validation steps you need to do depends on what isolation level you're going to run at. So if you want to run at serializable, you have to do both of them. Repeatable reads, you have to run the read stability check. But for snapshot isolation and read committed, you essentially don't have to do anything other than just the basic protocol of making sure you only read consistent version of the database, right? This is, again, this is what, when we have that hierarchy, read committed is below, um, is below snapshot isolation. So you can sort of get that for free. All right, so now, and again, in the paper, they talked about this difference between optimistic and pessimistic. Again, the optimistic is basically just checking, just doing this validation at the end, everything we just talked about uh, in the last slide, and then we'll do our, our take, take our scan set again and apply it to the indexes and make sure we don't have any phantoms. In the pessimistic case, it's essentially doing strict two-phase locking. Uh, but instead of locking on just objects, or sorry, the tuples themselves, the, this is, they have that hash table, and they'll actually do locking on the bucket. So that prevents anybody from inserting something in a bucket, and we would end up with a phantom read. And then we'll have to use separate background thread for deadlock detection. Again, this is the standard uh, two-phase locking stuff we talked about last class. So this is the graph this, from the paper that just shows the difference, the performance difference you can get from the optimistic case and the pessimistic case. Uh, and so this may not seem like a huge gap here when you go scale up to 24 cores, but if you look at the scale of, of, of the y-axis, this is running about 1.5 million transactions a second. This is running like 120, 125, you know, 1.25 to 1.2 million transactions a second. So the gap here is roughly around 200 to 250,000 transactions a second, right? I'm running on a single box. And that's pretty significant, right? We've done experiments with like MySQL and Postgres on sort of uh, similar workloads. And, you know, the, the box wasn't as nice as this, but we can do mostly. 30 to 40,000 transactions a second, right? So this is running a, you know, a pretty, pretty good speed here. Um, and basically the main takeaway is the optimistic case is, is ideal, right? Because it allows for better opportunities for concurrency. Uh, you don't have, you don't, um, you don't have, more, you don't have like false positives of holding things back when you maybe didn't need to. And so in general, optimistic MVCC is the, always the better approach. In the case of MySQL, they use a variant of two-phase locking in MVCC, sort of something like this, so they're still doing a pessimistic approach. Postgres is considered optimistic as well. So um, what are some main takeaways we can get about the implementation uh, of Hecaton? So they have two, ba two basic takeaways. The first is that you always want to use lock-free data structures. So that means you don't want any latches, spin locks, critical sections, mutexes, you don't want any of those things. We'll talk more about what the different types of uh, lock-free data structures you can use, like skip lists and BW trees, next week. Um, but they're basically using uh, lock-free data structures for everything in the system. So using it for the indexes, the transaction map, any kind of memory allocation information maintaining, and the garbage collection stuff. 
The second is that you want to minimize the number of serialization points you have in the system, the sort of the single point of, of bottleneck. And in their case, the only spot that they have is when you have to allocate a new timestamp for the transactions, right? So again, we talked about this last class, right? Everybody's trying to get a unique timestamp and always moving this, this counter forward. So in that case, for Hecaton, they're using the atomic addition approach with a compare and swap instruction to just increase this counter by one over and over again. This, again, real quickly, I'll just show some performance numbers to give you an idea of how much faster Hecaton is. So these are three sort of sample SQL Server customers uh, reported by Hecaton. So they're showing what they were getting before they used Hecaton and what they get after. So in case of this gambling website, they're tracking every single uh, interaction with you on the website, and so they're trying to ingest as much data as they can. So what they can get here is they can get from before they were at 15,000, now they're at 250,000. This one is ingesting new information about some kind of warehouse inventory status. And before, they were doing uh, 7,400 transactions a second, and now they're ingesting 120,000 transactions a second. So this totally changed how they actually use the database system, because before, because it was so slow, they would do a batch update at the end of the day, but now they can do everything in real time. And then for this foreign exchange broker, before they were doing about 2,800, and now they're doing about 5,300. But the key thing to point out is, before, they were running with a four-second latency, and now they're running at a sub-second, right? So again, this is comparison, comparing a, a disk-based system like SQL Server with a main memory system like Hecaton. And the performance difference is quite significant. OK, so in the remaining time, I want to spend, uh, I'm going to talk about the different design choices we're going to make when we use multiverse and concurrent control um, and show you the different options that are available. Because in, in the Hecaton paper, they sort of say, we did this, 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 and this. But for all those different design choices, there's different options they could have used. So I want to go through the, the three different categories of, of, of the system and help you understand what the trade-offs are going to make, what trade-offs you can make when, when, you, when you pick them. And for this, we'll get to the garbage collection stuff that he was asking about. So the first design choice is, how are we going to maintain the version chains? So in the paper, they showed how the chain went from the oldest version to the newest version. So when you created a new version, you always appended it to the end of the list. And then when you would look up to find a, a new version, you would you know, probe the index. The index would point to the oldest version. And then you walk through the chain following the pointers to define the version that you were looking for. So what the advantage of this is that uh, it's really easy to append a new version because you just add it to the end of the list. But then the problem is every time you do a lookup, you have to traverse that list. An alternative approach is to flip it and have it go from, from newest to oldest. So now what happens is any time you have to update a new version, you just, append, you just insert it to the front of the list. But the problem with this is that now you've got to go back to all your indexes that are pointing to, to that, that version and update its pointer to now point to your new version. But then the advantage of this is that when you do a lookup, you follow the index and it points right to the version you're looking for and you don't have to f follow any pointers. Right? So the ordering of the, the different versions can have a major difference in performance, but it depends on what your workload looks like. If your workload is insert heavy, then you probably want to use oldest and newest because you can just insert into the end very quickly and you don't have to update a lot of indexes. If your workload uh, is doing mostly reads, then doing the uh, newest to oldest is better because you would go jump to the newest version always right away and then you can, you can you know, not have to follow the pointers. So in Hecaton, it's not, I'm actually not sure what version they use. So in the paper, that we read, they go from oldest to newest, but I've seen other presentations and other PowerPoint decks from them that show from newest to oldest. Uh, so I guess we just I could email them and ask them, but um, it doesn't affect what the uh, correctness of the algorithm is, but it, again, it can have implications for performance. The next question is, how do you actually store the different versions? So again, in the Hecaton paper, they always insert a new version as a new tuple in the table, and then they have the version chain to keep track of it. right? This is what Postgres does as well. An alternative approach is what I'll call the delta method. And this is where you're going to maintain a separate space in memory uh, for older versions. And then in your main data table, you'll have a single master version. So if a transaction comes along and wants to update the tuple, you copy the old version to this separate rollback segment area. And then you overwrite the master version with the new data. Right? I'll show what this looks like in, in, in a second. One thing to keep track of, uh, or one thing to be mindful of, uh, what 
these different versions are going to allow us to do later on is we're going to be able to do time travel queries potentially. So if you want to be able to say what was this you know, version of the database at this point in time, these versions are already there. You can do this for you. But in the case of the insert method where you're always depending on a new tuple, that's really easy to do because you just go look, do a scan, and you find the version you're looking for. In the case of the delta method, that's harder to do because when you want to go back to an older version, you have to go reapply what's in the delta to, to put the tuple back to the correct state. So I'll show what this looks like now. So say we have our main data table. We have a begin and, and timestamps, and then we have our two attributes. And let's say our transaction wants to update the balance for this particular tuple here. So again, instead of inserting a new tuple here, we're going to, main, we're going to copy the old version to this rollback segment here. But we're not going to actually copy the whole tuple. We're just going to copy a delta of what got changed. So in this case here, we're only updating the, this attribute here. So our delta will just have the begin and end timestamp we had before, and then just the, the one attribute that got modified, the older version. And then we can apply our updates here. Same thing. Say we want to update this guy again. We copy the old version there, and then we overwrite the, the original value in the master version here. So now to go back to an older version, uh, you have to say I want to go back to this version here. I would follow this pointer to, to this version here and then apply these deltas in reverse order to go back to the, where it was in that state of time. Yes? So the question is, what's, can, what's the advantage of doing this? Uh, the advantage of doing this is say I have a really wide tuple. I have a thousand columns, but I'm only updating one of those columns at a time. I only need to store you know, just the bare minimum number of attributes that, that are maintained. We'll talk about it in a second, but this actually makes it also easier to do garbage collection. Because now I don't need to scan through the entire table and see, is this version still visible or not? I can go to one location that has all my older versions, find the, the, the cutoff for my, for my timestamp of what's still visible, and just blow it away. So this approach is what, this is what, my, uh, this is what MySQL uses, and this is what Oracle uses. SQL Server does something, something slightly different in the newer versions. They, they maintain a separate table. Uh, so they don't insert into the main data table. They have a separate space, but they're copying the entire tuple. And they call them time travel tables for that reason. Um, time travel queries are not a new idea. This actually was in the first version of, of Postgres in the 1980s. Uh, they ended up getting rid of it in 1997 because you know, not many people were actually using it. It's only like financial firms that care about like regulatory reporting and care about like, what did my database look like three years ago. Uh, so that means your database kept getting bigger and bigger as you executed more transactions. So this brings us sort of a nice segue to the next concept, uh, to do garbage collection. So again, if you want to do time travel queries, you just let, you, you let yourself accumulate all the old versions that you want. Um, and you know, at some point, someone may come and ask you for them. That's OK maybe in a disk-based database system, because disk is cheap and you can have store lots of it. In a main memory system, this is problematic, because your space is limited. So if your database is going to grow very quickly, you could easily run out of DRAM in, in, in a week or so. So the diff two different approaches to do garbage collection are one to do a background vacuum thread that's going to do periodic scans over the entire uh, table and look for older versions, check to see whether they're visible, and then delete them and reclaim the space. So this is what Postgres does. Postgres has a background vacuum worker that scans the entire tables and looks for you know, older versions and deletes them. Uh, one way they, they try to improve things is they maintain like a bit vector to say, you know, is this, has this block been modified since the last time I ran the vacuum? If not, uh, then I don't bother even looking at it. Or I, I, I know there's an older version that's not going to be there. Uh, the approach that's used in Hecaton in other systems are what are called cooperative threads. And the idea of this is that as, transact, as the, the, the worker threads execute queries and traverse the chains, they can be instructed to say, hey, by the way, go check to see whether you come across a version that's not visible anymore, and, and can you delete it? So you think about it, you're already doing that checking to see whether the begin and end timestamp follow within the range of, of the query you're trying to process. You can also maintain a sort of high watermark as a global variable to say, any, any tuple that has a version that comes before this timestamp is not going to be visible at all, so go ahead and delete it. So as the threads are executing, they can find older versions, and they can just delete them for you and sort of clean things up. So obviously, the different approach, approaches matter on what the, the application looks like. Uh, and the amount of overhead you're going to experience when you do garbage collection depends on how fast you're, you're, you're inserting things or how fast you're updating things. So in the case of Hecaton, they report about a 15% overhead uh, doing garbage collection. 
Um, and I've seen numbers that say this is, this is pretty similar, so this is pretty standard. Um, if, if when you're doing a really heavy workload. Uh, but in practice, it's going to be much less if you have a so more, more read-heavy workload. OK, so given these design choices, I want to make some observations that about how Hecatom would perform for the modern mixed workloads, the hybrid transaction processing workloads. So the first is that the read and scan set validations are really expensive if your transactions access a lot of data. right? So it doesn't necessarily mean your transaction have to be, be updating a lot of data, but it could read a lot of data. Right? And so one of the things that we're seeing uh, become more common now in main memory databases is that people are being more loosey-goosey with what kind of queries that they're executing. Right? So in the old days when you had a disk-based system, uh, and, if, and if it wasn't optimized to do analytical queries, people were pretty careful about what they would execute because they could fire something off that could take minutes or hours to run and never finish. And they probably would trigger something to the DBA, and they would come back and maybe ban you from running, running queries. Right? But now with main memory databases, they're so fast, people are just firing off whatever they want uh, and not maybe being so careful about what they're executing. Right? It's sort of like you take, take for granted that when you flip a light switch, it just, the lights turn on. Right? You don't think about all the stuff that's going on underneath behind the scenes to make that happen. So now when in these main memory databases, because they're so fast, because they can return results much more quickly than before, people are, are using them more. So if we're doing the read and scan set validation that Hecaton does, that means that our, our, the number of pointers we, we, we could be keeping track of can get quite large. The second observation is that the insert method that they're using, where you insert new versions as new tuples in the main data table, is actually problematic when you want to run analytical queries that want to do large table scans across, you know, across the database. Right? Because what's going to happen is if you have to follow the different version chains for every single tuple you're looking at, if you want to do a complete sequential scan for a table, you have to go down every single version chain. So that means that for every single time you, you have to check a version, you have to look at, look, at, you know, look at the timestamps and make a decision whether you should follow the pointer to the next version or that's the version you're looking for. And that really hurts performance when you do want to do vectorized execution on large portions of, of the database. The, second, uh, the final problem is that in the case of Hecaton, they're doing record level conflict checking which may be too coarse grain for some applications. So again, in the case of Hecaton, they didn't never look to see what attributes you actually modified. They just saw that you, this transaction and this transaction both wrote to the same tuple. Therefore, that's a conflict. I'm, I'm going to have to abort one of them. But it may be the case if I have, say, three attributes, a primary key, attribute one, attribute two, and you modify attribute one, and I modify attribute two, well, technically, we don't conflict as long as we didn't read, it any, you know, we didn't read things out of whack. So doing the, sort of the core screen checks may, be, may incur false positives where you're aborting transactions when you necessarily did not have to. So based on these observations, the Hyper guys came out with a paper last year with their version of MVCC based on these, these precepts. The first is that they're not going to use the insert method with version chains. They're going to use the rollback segments with deltas. And then if you have a transaction that updates an attribute that's not indexed, you're, you're, you're allowed to do in-place updates directly where the tuple originally exists. If you modify something that's indexed, then you have to delete the old version and insert it as a new tuple. Right? And that's sort of the easy way of doing uh, MVCC. They're going to be doing newest to oldest version chains. So that way, like, again, as you scan a table, you're always going to find the newest version and you don't have to follow the pointers. We're not going to talk about too much about predicate locks until next week, but this is basically is going to allow them to avoid having to do expensive scan checks during the validation phase. And of course, they're doing the same thing as before, is that if you have two transactions that have a write-write conflict, you always abort the, the last guy, right? So you avoid any cascading rollbacks. So we'll talk more about how Hyper works later on, 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 on the, in the semester. But the main thing to understand is that it's an in-memory column database system that can support fast transactions directly on the columns, right? So we, here we have two attributes. We have name and then the, the balance. And then they have this version vector that's stored separately as a sort of contiguous block of memory that for every single tuple at a certain offset, it's going to point to the rollback segment that has all the delta changes that were made by the transaction. And then another difference between previous people that have done rollback segments is that they're going to or organize them on a per transaction basis rather than a per tuple basis. What I mean by that is say you have a single tuple, uh, you would have some space in memory that would have all the modifications that were, that were made to it across all transactions. 
In the case of Hyper, they're going to organize them based on, per, on, on each individual transaction. So each individual transaction may have modified multiple tuples, but they're all the deltas are sort of grouped together um, in the rollback segment. And that's going to allow them to do really fast validation. So in this case here, the version vector would point to the latest version, and then you would have another pointer to go back to the older version in the chain. Right? And the reason why they're doing this approach is doing in-place updates is now when you want to do an OLAP query, everything is still now nice contigu contiguously in main memory. And you can do the vectorized execution and the fast pipeline uh, operations on this data and not have to follow the, the, the vector chains or the, um, the version chains. Right? But again, the, the basic level, high level idea of what they're doing is essentially the same. You're checking these timestamp ranges to see whether something's visible to the transaction or not. And then you make decisions about you know, you know, whether the transaction was allowed to commit or not, doing a validation step. OK, so to finish up, uh, the last two schemes I want to talk about really quickly are high rise and uh, uh, HANA. High rise is using the insert method, right? So they're having the version chains. They don't have a rollback segment. They're doing oldest to newest. Um, they're not doing any garbage collection because they want to allow you to be able to do the time travel queries. Um, and all updates to existing tuples are just executed as delete and insert. So currently, our version of Peloton is essentially doing the same thing as, uh, as high rise, which actually I think is not the right thing to do. I think that the, the hyper way is actually a better approach, but we'll get to that later. And then lastly, in HANA, we'll discuss more about uh, the high level architecture of what HANA does later on. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what they actually do for MVCC, and I probably should just email the guys directly. Um, but they're doing the insert method without a rollback segment, and then they have an optional background garbage collection thread to sort of clean things up. I don't know whether they're doing oldest and newest. I don't know whether, uh, you know whether they're using any kind of more sophisticated time stamping scheme to be able to figure things out. There's a lot more going in HANA than high rise and high hecaton and, uh, and hyper uh, that we're not going to talk about now. But they basically can store things as both rows and columns and organize them with different, different engines. It's actually very complicated. SAP bought a ba basically a bunch of a Korean database startups, and they sort of mashed everything together uh, in sort of this weird Frankenstein thing. So they're, they're slowly rectifying it, but it's not clear what they're actually doing to do transactions correctly. OK, so what are the main takeaways? The main takeaway you should get from this lecture is MVCC is currently the best concurrent control scheme that we have available today that for supporting transactions and mixed workloads. Right? If you want to do analytical queries and transactions on, at the same time, you need to use MVCC because it doesn't, it, 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 the protocol allows readers to be able to access the database with two older versions without blocking any writers. Whereas in like two-phase locking, you can't do that. I also think that the approach used in Hyper is, is considered, this, I would consider that the state of the art right now. And I consider that they make a lot of good design choices Supporting for supporting HTAP workloads that the Hecaton guys don't. Right? The Hecaton guys are just trying to build this one engine just to do fast OLTP, and then they were going to have a separate engine do uh, the analytical stuff. I don't know whether that's a bifurcated environment. I don't know whether that means that they have to have, to have two copies of the database, whereas in, um, in, MVC, in Hyper, they can have a single copy of the database and allow transactions to update things, even though it's still in a column store. So. Uh, for next class, we'll spend time uh, in, in the introduction talking about store procedures. Uh, I've been sort of vague on what store procedures are and why they actually matter. Uh, we'll talk about what, how they actually can help performance of transactions. Um, and then we'll spend time talking about optimistic concurrency control. And we'll focus on, in the reading, we'll focus on a system that came out of MIT and Harvard called Silo, uh, which is sort of a, the, I would say, the, again, the state of the art for the OCC algorithm. Any questions? Yes? The question is, when you're doing validation, do you need to lock the the? the so you're doing validation to make sure that what you read, you can still read. Yes. So suppose there are ten things that you that you read. You check the first thing, but by the time you go on to check the tenth thing, the first thing can be modified again, right? All right. So the, this question is, during the validation step, do I need to lock the things I'm reading again? to make sure there, weren't, there are not any modifications. So let's talk about this. Let's say you read something that was written to by a transaction yet that has not committed. 
Well, you wouldn't allow to be able to do validation because you have to wait for him to finish before, before you can decide whether you, you actually should be able to commit or not, right? Let's say that you read, therefore, an older version from a transaction that has already committed. Well, again, it's MVCC, so our older version is guaranteed to still be there. So internally, the database system is going to keep track of, here's all of the transactions that are still running, right? That's the transaction state map. So you would say, for this, for, here's my state map. Here's the oldest timestamp that I need to maintain in my database to make sure that's still visible, because there's somebody out there that may still need to access it. So nobody's going to allow to, to be able to throw away an older version because they know that you need to go check and see it's still there. So in your case, the, the example you came up with couldn't happen because no one would be allowed to delete that, 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 that first guy. That's a good point, though, right? Any other questions? I'll say also, too, real quick as an aside, Hecaton, uh, MemSQL is based on the Hecaton approach. So the story goes, when the, the, the MemSQL guy was, was at Microsoft, he saw the Hecaton presentations internally about, here's how we're going to do MVCC. And he went, and that's basically the same approach that they're using in, in MemSQL. So if you understand Hecaton, you understand MemSQL. Okay? All right, guys. See you on Wednesday.